Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Weekend Watch Repair. My name is Adam. I am so thrilled to be able to bring this video to you today because this gorgeous Seiko chronograph, uh, model 61396012 from 1972, is going to be our 5,000 subscriber giveaway watch. Um, three months ago, we did a giveaway on this channel where we gave away a, a Hamilton for the to celebrate the channel reaching 1,000 subscribers, someone had said, hey, you should do a 5,000 subscriber giveaway. And I said, sure. Uh, I didn't really think it would only take three months to get there, but here we are, and it's incredible. And so I sourced this Seiko chronograph because I said, uh, you know, they wanted a vintage Seiko for the giveaway, so here we are. Uh, taking a look at this thing, just checking functionality, and we're going to test the rollover here. And yeah, right about seven minutes past midnight. That's not bad. Winding it or uh, setting the time on it, you know, feels pretty good. Canon pinion feels may, a bit stiff. It may just be dry, but uh, not bad. Check the quick set here. Pushing it in initially will change the date and you push in further and you can change the day. And once you kind of get the hang of it, you can know how much to press it in. You can set each of those independently. There's no wine in this thing. It's a automatic only, only, so we're gonna give it a little Seiko shake to put some wine in the watch and check the chronograph function. It seems to start up okay. The initial resting point looked good, but I cannot, that button is stuck, which is pretty typical of these old watches. Uh, you know, when they get into, you know, this age of not being touched. So I had to take it off camera there to get that pusher reset. And now the reset pusher, everything lined up. I mean, that's fantastic. That thing looks to be lining up just exactly where it should. So this watch has the uh, less common and uh, somewhat rare triple railroad bracelet. And what's special about that one is all original links are there. It's uh, it's fantastic. So on this giveaway watch, um, and this is the first time I'm opening it up. I had to actually open it up off camera to set that pusher in, but this is the first time really inspecting this movement is right here as I'm filming. Uh, first thing I noticed is that the uh, case back gasket was missing, but we're gonna go ahead and, and manually put some wind in this watch so that we can put it on a time grapher and just get some initial readings and see what this thing looks like. So I've got my time grapher preset to 54 and a half degrees for the lift angle, uh, which is correct for this movement. And that will only affect the amplitude rating. Uh, it won't change the, the rate or the beat error that's shown on screen. But um, amplitude is quite low. Uh, beat errors kind of high. It's running a hair fast. But actually, this is really encouraging. The lines are, you know, very parallel. There's not a whole lot of noise. So this watch just looks like it needs a service. And that's that's great. That was actually what I was really hoping for. The reason I settled on this watch for the giveaway, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and talk while you see me start to disassemble this, because frankly, we've had this movement on the channel more than once. And... Uh, you know, and at the way, one of the reasons why I decided to do this giveaway was uh, I'm kind of known for having a bunch of Seiko videos and especially vintage Seiko chronographs, which are something I really enjoy. But as far as this giveaway goes, I, I wanted to find something. It, it was a, a toss up between do I find one that's just in horrible shape that needs a heck of a lot of work and then rebuild it all, make it nice and awesome and then give that away. Or do I go a different route and go for, you know, originality? And so I decided initially to go with the latter. I was going to see, can I find a really good original piece uh, that needs, a you know, a tune-up looks good, but they're only original once. And so this thing may be a good candidate for like case polishing and all that, but once you've done it, you can't undo it. So, and the case actually isn't bad on this thing. So I found this watch on eBay. I bought it. I'm in the central USA. Uh, this watch came to me from Australia. Uh, the person who had the eBay listing uh, said that this watch had been in their family. It was their father's watch, and he, it's been in their family for since since new. And I was look, kind of looking at their channel. They weren't really a watch dealer. Um, I mean, like I was looking at stuff that they had previously sold, and you know, there was motorcycle parts and uh, a watch. There were some uh, sports cards and sports memorabilia. And just random things. I'm like, okay, well, this person's not like a watch 
dealer. Like I, I doubt that they've really gone through and done a whole lot to this thing. So I had my fingers crossed that they were right. And after we go through this entire watch, I really have no reason to doubt them. Someone has been in this watch at some point, that gasket, I can tell you has been missing from this watch for a very long time. Uh, Cause you can see the, the, the moisture ingress that has got onto that um, movement ring. Uh, that wouldn't be there if there was a gasket there. So uh, this thing has been missing a gasket for a very long time. And the gaskets that are there for the pushers and the crowns and all that are quite old. So take a look at this. This is, this is amazing. We pull this movement out of the case and look at that dial. That dial is just unbelievable. I, I lost my breath at the workbench. That dial is so gorgeous. So I, and I knew at that point that I had hit the jackpot on this watch. I would love to have this for myself. So we're pulling the hands off. And one thing about these hands is that chronograph hand can get really, can be really stuck on there. Then you got to, there's a lot of upwards travel to remove those. So just being very careful not to damage, especially the hour hand that I'm pulling up on. And we'll get that sub register minute counter hand off of there. And now we can continue disassembly of this watch. So the reason I referenced this thing as a, Bruce Lee in the thumbnail was that although technically, technically speaking, some of the purists out there may have seen that thumbnail and said, that's not a Bruce Lee. And you're technically correct. And by the way, on this dial, see the dial says two nine and the first two digits of the serial in the case back are two eight. That is August and September respectively of 1972. So that gorgeous dial is original to this watch. So that's just phenomenal. So, Bruce Lee, the term Bruce Lee, um, it's almost as ubiquitous now as the, the term Pogue where, you know, I, uh, like William Pogue, Commander Pogue, he wore a six, one, three, nine, 6,005, specifically a, uh, 70 meter resist dial, six, one, three, nine, 6,005. And that was the actual Pogue watch. Now that actual, that very watch he wore uh, was auctioned off, I think a couple years ago. So it's, it's basically known what a true actual Pogue is, but that case shape, uh, that, that style is just so there were several models of it. Like the case shape, there's a 6139, 6005, 6009. Those are the two case models released for U S sales, non U S, um, watches from Seiko uh, with that were the case models, 6000 and 6002 all basically the same watch, the same, they had the, the, uh, Pepsi bezel. Um, there were blue dials, gold dials, others, a silver dial. So I'd love to get my hands on the silver dial, but, uh, those blue dials and yellow dials, I mean, they basically, they're all called pogues now because it's just a generalized term, but a true pogue is very one specific model. It's the same thing with these Bruce Lee's where there was several cases. I mean, this one here is a six, one, three, nine, 60, 12, but there's a 60, 10, 60, 11, 60, 12, 60, 15, 17, and 19. All those are basically the same case, depending upon where they exported them to, where they sold them. There's blue and black are the most common. There's a black with a white subdial. There's a gold version. Um, and they refer to all of them as Bruce Lee. I think Bruce Lee, he specifically wore, I think it's basically stated, I may be wrong, but it was a 6139-6010 black proof dial. Uh, first year model, which would have been 1969. Uh, they're all kind of known as Pogues now. This particular watch, I, it does have another term. It's less commonly used, but they called it a, a deep blue, which I think is fantastic, very accurate. Um, so that's why I use Bruce Lee on the thumbnail because more people would know that. Technically speaking, an actual Seiko Bruce Lee is a 70 millimeter resist model 6010. This is a blue model 6012, but all of them are called Bruce Lee's now. So it's just a Again, anymore, it's 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 just a common term that everyone uses for that case shape and that style of watch. Okay, enough history on Pogue and Bruce Lee terminology. But uh, so this particular watch, I'm really pleased. Um, this one here is an actual survivor. It's got the rare bracelet. It's an all original watch. Everything's there. Everything's correct. And just uh, I think this is a perfect candidate. If I, to go to the originality route. And if the winner of this watch decides they want to polish it or do whatever, it's your watch, do with it as you please. But they're only original ones. And this thing is just phenomenal in a very uh, unique and uh, 
less common combination with that bracelet that actually has all its links that actually this watch even actually fits my larger wrists. So, uh, I mean, if you have larger wrist, I have a, about an eight point eight and a quarter inch wrist, uh, about 21 centimeters. And, um, this watch actually fits me. It's generally not the case. So this watch here doesn't have a whole lot of problems. There is, um, something really interesting. We're going to do a full jewel upgrade on this watch for the barrel on the main plate and the bridge. And the lower arb report on these is kind of what's known as the weak point. Uh, if this watch does have one weak point, that is it. And this watch will show you very specifically what happens over time on these and, uh, kind of why the whole market exists for these jewel upgrades on these movements. This one shows it very clearly. And, uh, but we're going to get that work done, but otherwise this watch is in great shape. It's all there. It's all original. The dials about perfect. All the, uh, the day and date discs are fantastic. Um, the hands are in decent shape. The loom is pretty faded on this, honestly. And, um, but that's what it should look like being that age. There was uh, oddly enough, as I'm taking this apart, uh, I finished the watch a couple days prior to me, you know, doing this voice work. And last night I, uh, sat down and, uh, I noticed that Spencer Klein had put up a new video. And again, uh, I don't necessarily know if I should name drop or anything, but Spencer Klein's got a YouTube channel. I really enjoy. He, um, he is probably forgotten more about these watch Seiko watches than I will ever learn. I mean, he, this is his trade. It's what he does to make his living. And he is just, um, just, it's unbelievable how much he knows. So I was watching him and he just uploaded ironically, uh, a restoration video, uh, where someone had sent him in a Pogue 61, 39, 6,005, same exact movement as this to, to, to work on. And one of the issues that on this watch is, uh, the movement holders and, the movement holder holds the movement great when you have it dialed down in the orientation you see on the video there. It holds it real securely. But just because of the shape of the, the, the main plate, it's kind of difficult to use the same movement holder when you have it in the dial-up position. And uh, you'll actually see me working, use it that way in this video for a while. And then I just, I you know, I remember I had that other holder and I, I actually switch it mid-video. But I'm watching Spencer work on this watch. Last night, watch the TV and he does something so simple. I never even considered thought of. And, um, you know, he, he basically puts the, the movement ring on the movement and then mounts it in his holder and it, it holds it perfectly. And I was like, Oh my gosh, what a simple workaround solution. And I would just, uh, my heart sank into my stomach <laughs> or into my feet after I saw that. I'm like, man, I just finished working on this thing. And, uh, you know, struggled to hold that thing level and all that stuff and finally moved it over. It's frustrating. And I saw Spencer do that. And I'm like, oh, light bulb. <laughs> you know, I got to watch this guy to come up with something I really should have thought of myself. So, hey, thank you, Spencer. I doubt you'll ever see this video. But if you do, when you were working on that poke, uh, on that video, you just recently posted uh, December 21st. The, uh, <laughs> you know, I got a handy little tip from you on that. I cannot believe I've been doing all this work for so long and just suffering through it rather than just doing that simple little hack. And it seemed to work just great. So <laughs> I kind of had to laugh about that because, you know, if you've ever worked on one of these, you know, it's fine in this orientation, you flip it over and that movement likes to wobble on. You can't really get a good grip on it. So anyways, I thought that was funny. People who've worked on these are probably laughing or know what I'm talking about. And the rest of the people are like, what is Adam rambling on about? Who cares? And you're not wrong, but it's one of those little things. So we're going to check side shake of this real quick. And that is not terrible. Actually, that bushing is going to be replaced with a jewel. Uh, but that actually is not bad. I've seen way worse on there, but the bottom arb report, the one on the main plate is really what, you know, is we're going to see that we're like, Whoa, that definitely needs some help. And, uh, that this one shows up pretty good. So here we are. We're taking the pallet fork apart. Here comes the bridge, just kind of breaking tension on it. And then we can lift that bridge out of the way and remove that pallet fork. So as I continue to dis disassemble this thing, um, I'll, I'll say it again before the video ends, but uh, for the purposes of the giveaway, uh, it's worth stating. So at uh, 
just like the previous one, which a, you know, I think went beautifully, uh, and the congrats again to the winner, Matthew. I hope you're still enjoying your Hamilton. Um, the watch could not have gone to a nicer fellow. Uh, I, I sure appreciate it. And what I really appreciate was he actually made an unboxing video <laughs> and posted it. And, uh, that made me feel good because there are some people which for the life of me, I can't figure out why I kept saying, well, it's a, you know, there, it's not a giveaway. It's some scam or whatever, which it's not. I'm just a guy out here doing a watch giveaway. Matt made an unboxing video and posted it. I thought that was fantastic. So thank you, Matt. It hushed all the naysayers. So, uh, it's worth say, saying that, uh, I'm, I'm still new to YouTube and all that. This channel's not huge, but I mean, I do not want anyone to get scammed. So just know on this giveaway at no point ever, will I ever ask you for any payment information of any kind whatsoever. You will not be asked for one single cent for shipping or any other expense. The winner will get this 100% free of charge that we're seeing. So if anyone contacts you saying, congratulations, you're the winner, you know, PM me for payment, whatever. That's not how this is going to work. Yeah. Take a look at that bottom side of that barrel arm report, by the way, see all that gunk on there. Ooh, later on, we'll see a close up, but you can see all that gunk on the, on the main plate as well. And actually some wear, uh, right there at the center where that arbor has been rubbing into the plate. And that's definitely. That's what those things look like when they go bad. That hole's kind of been worn out some and all that. And by the way, I'm just going to check in shake on the center wheel before we take it apart. Just to see what it looks like. And it looks pretty good. So on the giveaway, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, leave this po posted. Uh, you're eligible to enter the giveaway. You just have to do two things. One is just be a subscriber to the channel. And the second thing is just leave a comment of any type. It does not matter. Just leave a comment on the video, on this video. What I will do after this post on Sunday, January 7th, 2024, I will create a video that same day uh, and post it same day. What we'll do is we will tabulate all comments on the video. Uh, and what we will do is we will remove duplicate users and, uh, it will also remove any comments from me. So what we will do is we'll filter it down and I will do it live on screen and uh, screenshot it. And it will take every comment from every ind unique individual, regardless of what the comment is. And those will all be, uh, entries. As long as they're a subscriber, they will be eligible. And then, uh, we will have a random comment chooser. It will show the winner on screen and that winner will have seven days to contact me. And uh, claim their watch. We will communicate. I uh, will provide my email address on that video. They can send me an email, and uh, we just need to show proof of identity, basically, just to uh, show a screenshot of you signed into YouTube under the winning username. We'll coordinate uh, the needed info, and your watch will be shipped to you free of charge, fully insured by me, directly from me to you, and you will also be provided tracking. So uh, that seemed to work out pretty well last time. It seemed to be easy enough for all parties involved. And, uh, and by the way, I, I really appreciated uh, having uh, those conversations with um, Matt, the winner of the last watch. So here, real quick, uh, I'm unwinding the mainspring barrel, and I unwind it kind of that weird way with my tweezers just to uh, get enough where I can easily get my fingers underneath it. And now we can unwind this watch manually, or the mainspring manually. And so this spring has got a little bit of a high spot in it. It's not bad. This spring is otherwise in really good shape, actually. There is a little bit of a high spot there. Uh, where really the, the inner coil is kind of bit downwards in that angle. So the, the adjustment really would not be adjusting the middle part of the spring. It would be adjusting the right side of the spring, those inner coils, but, uh, that's easily flattened and made even. So we're going to, that original main spring is great. And just doing some checking here on the jewels before pre-cleaning that there's the third wheel jewel. There's a center wheel jewel. And that just looks like old gummed up lubricant. Uh, it's not over lubricated by any means, but it's just what little bit is there is gummed up. That escape wheel there, it looks dry as a bone. If it's okay, it's clean. The pallet fork is looks perfect. I mean, it's just, I mean, it almost looks like it's already been cleaned, but it hasn't. Here, take a look at, so here's that lower barrel arbor port. And you can see the gummed up old black lubricant that's basically turned into a paste. And then you can see where it's been rubbing on the plate there in that bushing. So we're going to go ahead and do a jewel upgrade. So we've shown this quite a few times already. It's this very simple process of just using the appropriate tooling pressing out the bushing in the bridge. And then uh, I'm doing this at a weird angle to get the camera in there. And usually if I'm not filming this, it's much easier. It's, I'm, I'm less clumsy <laughs> when I'm doing it, but 
I'm pushing that jewel in from the back side of the plate and I want to get it flush with the plate. And so I'm, I'm kind of holding this perpendicular to, you know, my, my body trying to get the camera to have a good angle. But as such, as I'm moving it around, it's, it's just awkward, <laughs> but we get it. We get it in there. The main plate, we have to uh, use some reamers and remount the hole for the bottom jewel. So that jewel has an outside diameter of 1.60 millimeters. So what I'm going to do is start with a 1.19 millimeter reamer. You can see I, I put some oil on it and I'm going to work in stages of one tenth of a millimeter. So this here's a second stage of 1.29 millimeters. I'm going to work this all the way up till I get to 1.59 millimeters. And so that one one hundredth of a millimeter difference is basically what the, the tension. So we're going to press fit this jewel into the main plate. And that one one millimeter is really all it takes for the tension to hold that jewel in place. So here's the final reamer, 1.59. And the reamer, cutting reamer itself is really there, but it's the, it's the flat past the cutting edge of the reamer that is 1.59 millimeters. Now we're just going to use a little deburring tool and deburr both sides of this main plate and then just kind of clean up the chips. We'll do that on the other side of the plate and clean those chips up as well. And then off camera after this, I put it under the microscope because there's actually a couple chips inside that hole. And uh, so I'll make sure all that gets cleaned out and is completely clean and ready to go. And I'm just kind of filming the last step of it here, but I'm pressing that jewel in from the dial side of the watch backwards because I want that jewel to be flush with that plate. And now we're going to put the bridge back on there with the barrel installed. And now we can just kind of check this thing. So first thing we'll do here. Let's do a side shake test and uh, which we know it's, you know, going to be good with these jewels. There's just the tiniest, absolute faintest bit of movement, but it still moves freely. Just kind of give it one more wiggle here. That looks pretty good in shake. The up and down is actually pretty, pretty darn good as well. Uh, kind of get a side profile view and I'm looking at the gap between the top of the barrel and the underside of the bridge. And that looks even all the way across. I'm really pleased with that A little puff of air. And that thing just spins great. I mean, that's just beautiful. That's exactly what I'm looking for. So that just, that's just fantastic. That jewel upgrade went really, really well. So here we've got all the parts light out. Aside from, uh, I do not have the balance in here and I don't have the pallet fork. I'm going to soak those in one dip. And I uh, just don't want to take a chance on damage, damaging anything. Uh, you know, but uh, we'll, we'll sort all these pieces into baskets and then uh, get this thing into the clean. One thing I do like to do, especially with these chronograph wheels, I don't really like to have much in the same tray as those chronograph wheels because uh, I just don't want to damage it. But we'll take all this stuff over and move it over to the cleaning machine, which I'm very spoiled to have. It's, it's definitely overkill for me. This Elma cleaning machine has one, the first stages of wash. The next three stages are rinses, and then it, that's followed by heating drying stage. And just real quick, I really would like to take this opportunity to, to just give a heartfelt thank you, absolute thank you to the folks who uh, thought it worthwhile to support me on uh, this channel on Patreon. It really means an awful lot. Special shout out to Ernesto, Wukash, and Sean, uh, our three newest members. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And by the way, <laughs> I really hope I pronounced that name correctly, Wukash. Um I am worked with a gentleman a long time ago, spelled his name the exact same way you did. If you're watching, um, he was from Poland and he corrected me once. He said, no, you, you know, you're pronouncing my name wrong. And he told me the correct way to pronounce it. I am just hoping that you pronounce yours the same way. So <laughs> the way I pronounced your name is exactly what he instructed me to do for his name. Um, I don't know if I got it right. Let me know. If not, I am very sorry. <laughs> Tell me how to pronounce it. And I'll actually correct myself on the next video, but uh, uh, thank you to everybody who's uh, helped me on there. That Your support means an awful lot. And by the way, if you are interested in taking a look, uh, all the information for that can be found on the description of the video. So we got the jewels cleaned, lubricated, and installed for the balance, and I'm just double checking everything. Here's a shot I haven't really shown before, but uh, I've described, I'm checking the spring between the regulator pins and make sure it's breathing. So you can see that spring going back and forth and at a rest, that spring should be not touching. Those posts should be sitting in between them um, with a very little gap between them, but uh, it breathes and goes back and forth and touches those. That actually looked really good. 
Never really found a good way to show that until now, but um, that's what I'm doing there. And now we can install the, get the barrel all put together. So I'm putting some S4 grease on the sidewalls here to act as braking grease for this. And I'll put about four dabs evenly spaced all the way across and kind of flatten them out, just kind of like you see there. And here I decided to wind this thing in manually and I wanted to film that whole process, but the footage for getting it started, I mean, it's definitely a two handed job and I didn't really have a good view, clear view on the camera until really I got to this point, but uh, I'm winding this thing in manually. Um, and that's kind of the process. So once I get it down to this tiny bit, I'm just working it very slowly. Uh, cause until that spring is all the way in, it will jump out with, if you give it just even the slightest opportunity, but, uh, I wish I could have captured it better how I first started, but, uh, that's how I manually wind them. And we're going to apply some 8,200 here to the spring. There we go. And that will work its way around uh, as we wind and unwind this movement. It won't take long for that grease to distribute. And then a little bit of um, medium viscosity oil for uh, the inside lip there where that barrel arbor is going to sit. So we'll go ahead and pop this arbor in. A little bit tight, but we managed to get in there. But the tooth on that arbor is not in that spring correctly. You can see how it's kind of outside of the hook on the eyelet on the spring. So we'll rotate it to the right. And there you hope, hopefully you saw it, how that kind of jumped in and now it's sitting in there exactly like it should. A little, one more spot of lubrication here on the top side of that for the bar where it's going to ride against the barrel lid. We can go ahead and get this thing put together. One more time on our little cheapo tool that does a great job and it just puts even pressure on that lid and presses down. You don't need this tool. You can close them by hand and close them with a pair of tweezers. Uh, it's just easy, but uh, just, I'm really inspecting it here just to make sure I, I have that thing flush and seated fully all the way around before moving on. But all that stuff's done. So we can actually put this watch together. Uh, we're going to start off here with the center wheel. A little bit of HP 1300 on there. And you can just actually see capillary action, pull that oil around. Putting in our barrel. And we can put on our bridge. Or center wheel bridge. You actually may notice uh, <laughs> I've got more than one pair of tweezers I'm using here. I think I've had brass tweezers, I think, actually, in every single video. Um, generally speaking, I got these pair of tweezers. Um, it's a different brand. I wanted to try them. And they're it's probably the probably the finest tipped tweezers I have ever come across. Uh, but I'm just kind of trying them here just to see how I like them. Anytime I got to try to put some force on something or lift a big plate or something out of the way. Um, I didn't want to either. I didn't want to scratch anything using metal tweezers. And I also didn't want to bend those very thin tips. So, um, I'm going back and forth, putting some oil here. I'm pressing down on that pinion and I'm getting some 90, 10 between the pinion and that bushing. I do this on every chronograph, but I don't always film it. And uh, this is the first time I kind of thought of a way. I think that clearly showed how to do it. And I'm just cleaning up my excess there. Now we can go ahead and put that in the watch. And uh, as I'm doing narration, I remember I <laughs> put this graphic here because I was thinking as I was editing the video, I oiled that pivot for the center wheel off screen. And I was editing the video and putting all that together. I said, Adam, you're probably going to forget this as you're narrating. So I put that graphic in there early. <laughs> and now that I'm narrating it, I did not forget. So uh, there we go. Got the bridge plate on and we're just giving it a little tap because at first that uh, escape wheel didn't really want to go in there, but now just not really pressing it down, just kind of holding it in place. And we're going give, to give this a spin. And yes, all that looked great. We got all the screws in and I'm just doing a final tighten on everything. We'll give this one more test. Perfect. Now we can put on our click spring. Sometimes, I don't know. Um, if you do these movements too, will you let me know? Sometimes like it looks pretty easy on the video. This one here is actually really easy. Sometimes those things fight me. I, I don't, I mean, I don't know what it is about them. Um, we got to put on our ratchet wheel, but before we do that, we need to lubricate the upper barrel arbor port. So there we go. Clean up a little bit of a mess. Now we can put on our ratchet wheel. 
Do we just make sure that's keyed to the barrel arbor correctly and that the teeth are, uh, the click spring is sitting between two teeth? And there we go. Tighten that screw down and then we'll get a little hold down tool tools. That way we can get a little bit of torque on it and tighten that screw. And before we put on this other cover plate, this, we need, we're going to lubricate our escape wheel and the third wheel and vice versa. I did the escape, third wheel first. That's the escape wheel. And I'm going to go ahead and while I'm at it, lubricate the post for the column wheel. There's the column wheel bushing. And then one more bit for the outside of that bushing. And I'm going to pull that lever aside and we can bring in our column wheel. Sometimes that operating lever can kind of get in the way. So I'm just kind of fiddling with it until it wants to go in. There we go. We tighten down our screw. And now we've got about 8,000 points <laughs> to, to lubricate on this system. So the first thing I like to do is pull that setting lever back again and then just, uh, or, or, you know, that column wheel setting lever or whatever you want to call it. I'm sure it has a proper name. I just can't think of it at the moment, but just pull it out of the way and I'm going to put some, uh, some heavy grease here. And one thing I'll do is uh, I'm, I'm going to lubricate the operating lever where it's going to engage with the column wheel. It's a little spot there. And so what I'm going to start here with is I'm going to, a couple spots around the wheel, I'm between two of those hor the horizontal teeth. And then what I'm going to do is go between the column wheels, just a dab on a few spots all the way around. And then on the back side of those teeth, uh, along with that, we will also do, um, the flyback lever right there. And then, uh, the, on the side of that little channel on the operating lever. And the reason we do this, um, that's obviously more lubrication than we need. Um, and I kind of let it sit there basically through the rest of the process. I'll work this thing around a few times. And as we put stuff on and finish putting the rest of the parts on and test the parts later, that grease will begin to work its way in. The last thing I do, and I actually don't think I actually put it on camera, but the very last thing I do before I put the case back on this thing is go over it with Rodico thoroughly and just clean up all the excess. So when it's actually said and done, um, you almost can't even tell us there, but there's just a very light film over all the proper parts. And one thing I'm doing here, just a little spot on the operating lever here where it's going to, you know, kind of ride along the underside of that hammer eccentric pin. Now we put some lubrication. That first one was an eccentric post, and here is the second post for our coupling levers. And we can put these in place. This is the first coupling lever. There we go, and actually seated on the underside of that clutch on the center wheel or uh, on the uh, chronograph wheel, which is excellent. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and, and cycle the column wheel over and index at one spot. And now it's in the proper position where that coupling lever can actually go up. There we go. Now we can put on our second coupling lever and the post that that sits on is an eccentric post. In the um, the UFO video that uh, I think it was two videos ago or three videos ago, or th three videos ago, uh, we built a Seiko uh, 6138 UFO, Yachtsman or UFO, whatever you want to call it. And uh, typically, it kind of we went through all the eccentric pins in that watch, and that's a dual register chronograph. There's another one for the uh, two more actually for the hour recording mechanism on that watch than this watch has. Uh, but generally speaking, if you never mess with those, you don't have to mess with those. They're kind of, when they're set from the factory, they're pretty much good. But if you are unaware or someone goes in there and starts turning them thinking that they're screws and then realizes they're significantly harder to turn than screws, um, you know, it, it can kind of throw your chronograph mechanism or your, your hammer or just whatever particular one you're messing with out of whack. Thankfully on this one, everything was just perfect. I mean, it doesn't look like they've ever been touched. Didn't have to adjust anything. They were still... Everything's in the right spot. Uh, once it's all back together and assembled, the chronograph functioned exactly like it should. So that was great. Uh, we didn't really have to mess with that. But we're lubricating that eccentric post here. The one that the hammer sits on, that's also an eccentric post. One of the, That's one of the differences between the Ace and B series models. If, um, I may be completely wrong, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway without looking it up. <laughs> but I do believe that um, on the A series, I'd have to look at one of mine, but I don't think that's an eccentric post 
on uh, the A series models is one of the slight variations on that. I could be wrong. Someone please correct me if I am. So we got that hammer in and I'm just cleaning up some grease where I applied it between the hammer and the flyback lever. And uh, just one more little dab here on the other side of that hammer where it's gonna engage with the column wheel. There we go. And then I'm kind of doubling up at this point because you know a lot of the grease we put on that column wheel will address that same thing, but uh, uh, I'm, we'll clean up all the excess later. And now I'm using some 9010 on the contact faces of the hammer. And if I had remembered to hit record on my microscope, I could have showed another two for two where I didn't actually screw those up. <laughs> uh, but I didn't hit record on my microscope and I definitely wasn't gonna do that twice. So, um, but, uh, so you kind of got a further away shot than, uh, I would have preferred, but now we can put on our operating lever or our operating lever spring. So this spring on one side connects to the second coupling lever. And I put my finger on it to keep this spring from joining the, uh, space program. And I'll use some brass tweezers to pull it up. And the other side of this gets put around the operating lever. So that spring is going to put constant pressure outwards on that operating lever and away from the chronograph wheel at the same time. And I'm just making sure it's seated as deeply into that little pocket on that stud as possible. Now we can put on our hammer spring. So that hammer's gonna sit around the, the hammer click post and then around that eccentric post. On two pins, we'll get that in, then we'll pull this back, sit it around that post. There we go. Making sure it's kind of in deep there. Now I put my finger down here just again to kind of keep the spring. Uh, it doesn't make for good video quality, but uh, that's just experience telling me to do that. And when I put that on there, I actually noticed there's a tiny bit of erotico on there from when I picked that spring up out of my parts tray. So I'm going to clean that up a little bit. There we go. That was driving me crazy. And uh, I noticed a couple spots on the, the ratchet wheel. And one thing, you know, again, this is macro footage, right? And I, I, I sometimes there may be a piece of dust or something that I don't actually see when I'm at my bench. The camera picks it up. The light may be hitting it differently. You know, uh, this is being recorded, uh, depending upon which camera out of a 50 millimeter or hundred millimeter macro lens. Oh, and here we're lowering the, or we're lubricating the minute recording wheel and putting that in place. But one of the things that I, I want to do better at, and, uh, I was hoping it would make a difference in this video. Although unfortunately, like I'm seeing a little, tiny little bit of dust here and there is like, I had an air purifier going in the room, uh, for a couple days prior and then during assembly, but I was hoping that would clean up maybe these tiny little particles that are in the air. It didn't really seem to, maybe I need to go get a dehumidifier or a humidifier actually, or something, but uh, you know, I'm not working in like a clean room in some sort of, uh, you know, proper watch servicing center. So I'm just trying to mitigate, you know, just standard dust as much as possible, I'm trying to keep my workspace clean. But one thing I need, I do kind of realize is that, I need to change up my finger cots more regularly. Uh, someone had, I was, I was on a form, uh, the form that I actually still participate on quite a bit and read, you know, a couple times a week that was created by the person I signed up for my initial courses with. He also has a form and uh, I'm on there quite regularly. And there's a lot of really experienced people on there. They were talking about um, a video of someone they saw uh, servicing a Rolex. Uh, I don't I think it's some semi old video, but the, that person wasn't using gloves or finger cots or anything. And then just dumping gallons of oil on the movement. And there were, you know, some critiques were being made of, uh, processes, but I mean, that got me realizing like, yeah, well, I have a, I'm a lot cleaner than that guy's workspace, but, uh, <laughs> and they were a professional, but you know, I, there is room for improvement on my part. So, um, like on my finger cots there, I can see some little bit of dust and all that. I, I, I don't want that in the watch. So I, I need to, you know, one of the things I'm going to try to be aware of is uh, doing a better job at that. But uh, I'm learning. I never claim to be a professional. I'm just trying to do my best. So we've got the hammer or the hammer click lubricated. And now we're just kind of giving a full test on this thing now that we got all the springs and everything put in place. That's actually feeling really good. Uh, everything's kind of working like it should. I'm going to move over and do the hammer. I'm feeling how much pressure it's taking to press that in. And if it's too much or too little, you can adjust that uh, hammer click spring. But this is actually feeling really nice. Um, if you don't put that lubrication on that, it will be darn near impossible to do, but that felt great. And I'm just gonna touch up a bit of the excess. 
And that just, I couldn't be more pleased with that. So now one thing I want to do is check the engagement of these call these coupling levers. And so we're engaging them and disengage them and checking the gap and make sure it's even on both of them. And that just, I mean, we're not directly overhead. My microscope is at a bit of an angle, but that looks just perfect. It's beautiful. Uh, we don't need to adjust that eccentric pin at all. So now I'm going to go ahead and lubricate the wheel train. There's the chronograph wheel. That's the minute recording wheel. Everything else on the back side of the watch has already been lubricated. So now we can lubricate the train from the dial side. So there's the center wheel. That is our third wheel. That's our escape wheel. And lastly, some lubrication for lower barrel arbor port. And again, we lubricated the bottom pivot for the minute recording wheel before we installed it. So we don't need to mess with that. Now we can install our pallet fork. Just kind of very lightly working this thing around till I kind of see that, saw that pivot kind of drop in there. Kind of got a bit lucky with that one. Didn't have to mess with it too much. And now I'm just putting in pallet fork bridge. I just want to, you know, that upper pivot didn't want to really go in there easily at first. It took me a minute, but there we go. Now it's in there. And just tightening those two screws. I'm going to put just a couple winds in this thing. And I just want to check the engagement and see if that pallet fork is kind of springing back and forth, locking and unlocking like it should. And yeah, that looks great. That looks just fantastic. Putting a little bit of lubrication onto the exit stone and applying that to five teeth at a time. And we will repeat that process two more times and cover all 15 teeth of that escape wheel in that same fashion. And now we can install the balance. And I actually, this one fought me a little bit, um, but we'll just keep the whole thing in here. So put that bridge on and I could not, like, my brain and my hands were not communicating properly because it, <laughs> I know what I wanted to do, but I had to mess with that thing and go back and forth a few times before it dropped in, but it finally did. The thing seemed to fire up. All right. So now we go. Now we press it down fully once it's in and we can go ahead and get our screws tightened on that thing. There we go. So yeah, just uh, at first glance, just kind of checking the spring and all that, seeing how it's breathing um, it's looking pretty good. Uh, no major things. It's uh, spring looks flat there. Um, yeah, just no major, no major issues. I'm also at this time checking, see that minute recording wheel and the chronograph wheel, it, the arm on the chronograph wheel kind of turn that minute wheel. That's what flicks that minute over for the chronograph. And so I'm going to speed this up in each rotation of that. Just checking to see how that finger interacts with that. And really what I'm wanting to make sure of is it's going to engage that middle tooth, which you want that tooth to be in the middle of the viewable window if everything's aligned properly. But I'm checking to make sure it doesn't touch it after it pushes that tooth over. There, just the tiniest gap, but it does clear it. And that's exactly what we want to make sure of. So now with that done, we're going to go ahead and demagnetize this movement. And I do this again on every watch, but I think I've only ever shown this demagnetizer in one other video but I uh, just thought it was worth kind of putting in there that every single one gets demagnetized, whether, you know, on my, I got a little phone app that checks for magnetism, whether or not that actually shows magnetism or not. Every watch movement at this point gets that in there. And so this is going to be a little different. This is only about 30 minutes after, since this watch has been running. And what I wanted to do was kind of show you me adjusting this, but I do a terrible job. And uh, because a, I'm doing it through a loop, which I hate can't stand them, don't like them, could never get used to them. And I'm trying to do this where you can just see the process. I'm trying to get the beat error set first. And I got this thing way sped up, obviously, but this thing is so touchy and I'm using a loop and it's just, it's difficult for me to do it. I usually do this under a microscope. So at one point I finally got so frustrated. I gave up and I said, you know what? I'm done with this. I tried. <laughs> I'm just going to go back and do it the way I've always done it and get it dialed in. So what we'll do here at this point, I cut the camera off. I finished. You kind of just set the time initially. This is about another 10 minutes later. Now this is where we're at. And so amplitude, um, high two twenties, low two thirties. And again, this is at this point, 35, 40 minutes 
is all this watch has been running. Um, excellent numbers, excellent numbers. That amplitude's probably going to get in the two fifties after about a week or so of running, uh, which is probably about there now. Actually it is there now. I actually checked it last night and, uh, it, it's just fantastic. So, uh, I wish I could have done a better job doing that off camera, but uh, just the way I had it set up and me using a loop, I'm just, it's not a very natural thing for me. I very rarely do I ever use a loop and especially using a loop while we're working with tools and hands. It's just, I'm not good at it. That's why I bought a microscope. <laughs> I'm spoiled. So anyways, that's all good. <laughs> and uh, we were going to continue on with the dial side of this watch. So we got our sliding clutch in there and got it lubricating. Um, and then proper lubrication for the setting lever. And then on this little flat spot here on the movement, that's where the yoke spring, yoke and yoke spring is going to go. And I'm going to lubricate this part here where the yoke's going to engage with that setting lever. So here comes the yoke. And the yoke springs kind of, that's all integrated into one part. Now I'm just going to hold that down and pop that into place and get it into that little channel on that sliding clutch. There we go. While I held that down, I'm going to lubricate the same contact points on the side of that yoke. And again, we'll go through and clean up the excess grease before we're all said and done. So here's our setting lever spring. And that uh, spring is on the left side of that. The right side, that is another spring that really just puts downward pressure on that setting lever. So when you push the stem release, when you let go of the pusher, and that that's what pushes the setting lever back down into position. And we're just going to lubricate the points on that setting lever spring where it's going to engage with the setting lever. And it's got three little notches on that spring. And those are the three clicks, the three positions for that crown. And that's uh, when you feel that click, that's where it's engaging. So now we're applying some grease to our stem at a few specific points on here. And then uh, just a little bit on each of the four flats of there, which is going to go inside the setting lever uh, and just a little bit more on the tip. Now we can install this. There we go. I thought it was in at first, but it didn't get it in. It needs to go in a bit more. So I get a, a little bit more of a nudge. There it goes. Now the thing's in there. Feels pretty good too. So I'm going to take this opportunity just to clean up a little bit of the excess grease. This is the post for the intermediate wheel. And that's for the minute wheel. And a little raceway for the minute wheel. And then we'll apply some grease here to the center wheel uh, shaft where the cannon pinion is going to mount. There we go. Had one little glob there, just evening that up. Here comes our cannon pinion. These are friction fit. Perfect. That went into place nice. There's our intermediate wheel. And uh, those, the teeth on those are not, on this particular one, aren't chamfered, but uh, that is a, there is an upside and a downside to that. There's kind of like an oil sink, it looks like, on the top of that wheel that that side needs to face up. And I'm just putting the minute wheel on, making sure the teeth are engaged properly between that and the cannon pinion. And now we can put on our minute wheel cover plate. And earlier I was, uh, I may have been rambling on about the difference in terminology and case models for Bruce Lee's and Pogues at the time. But on this minute wheel cover plate, the two screws that hold this down are different for each side. So that one, the first one I put in is um, a, a countersunk screw. And that one there is just a standard, you know, flat cut, flat undercut screw on the other side. So uh, just make sure the right one's on the right spot. Now we can put on our day jumper spring. And this is easily the stronger spring in this watch. Technically speaking, uh, you don't have to remove that spring if you're just going to do a regular service on a watch. You can keep that on there, but I'd, I'd like to just re just to remove it. But uh, I am going to put some heavy grease between that and the, the day lever, the jade jumper lever. And then just use my uh, little bit stronger tweezers than the, than the brass ones to pull that spring back and get that set into proper position. And then just a little bit of cleanup. And then there is one lubrication point I forgot to put on camera, but um, the back side of that setting lever to that day, day jumper lever, uh, some grease did go there, but I apparently did that. Uh, um, my camera had died at one point. I it just, it didn't get on camera, but it did get done. So that is the day and day quick set 
lever. That is uh, when you're pushing in the crown, that is the lever that engages the day wheel or the date wheel to uh, change those. So we lubricated those posts and now we're gonna get the calendar works taken care of. So putting lubrication down for the date driving wheel, the calendar driving wheel, the intermediate wheel and the cannon pin on the cannon pinion for the hour wheel. So there's our calendar wheel. And our intermediate wheel, there's a small gear or small pinion on the underside of that that drives the date driving wheel. And the large teeth on that are what gonna connect with the hour wheel that we are putting on now. So you just wanna make sure that hour wheel is connected between those and that small pinion on the minute wheel. I have to fiddle with it for a minute and then you'll see it seat down. There we go. Now it's seated down fully. So that little plastic part, uh, that little triangular piece there, like the 12 o'clock mark, that is the day finger. That's gonna drive, or the date finger. That's gonna drive the date wheel. And that is the day driving wheel. And that little finger at the five o'clock position is actually what's gonna engage with the gear on the other side of the day disc to drive that. Now we can go ahead and lubricate this post and get our date jumper installed. And the spring is integrated into this part like Seiko likes to do with a lot of those. So we'll apply some, just a tiny dab of grease there to the back side of that and a little, little bit of 9010 to the faces on that jumper end. We'll go ahead and set that spring into place. Just like that. Once that's done, we can put on our date wheel. So we'll kind of get this date wheel into the position here and rotate it to where the jumpers between two teeth. We'll pull that jumper back and you can see how that date jumper kind of fell into place and we just set tension on it. Now we can put on our cover plate. And so this cover plate serves multiple functions. Um, first and foremost, it is a cover plate that uh, holds down the date disc uh, to keep it from raising up. But it also um, is a cover plate for that quick set and it's not sitting flush right now. That quick set lever is kind of sitting underneath it. So we'll kind of press in our crown a little bit. There we go. And it, 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 that it allowed that cover plate just to set down the tiniest bit, but now it's sitting flat. And that's the one thing on these, you really got to make sure that thing's flat before you tighten those screws down. But it's a cover plate for all those parts. And it's also got the jumper for the day wheel as well. And it's all integrated in that one little part. But now we're just going to go ahead and test that and see how the first half of that kind of turns that date. And then you, there's still a little bit more travel afterwards. And that's that last 20% of the movement is actually, if you press it that deep, is what'll turn over the day wheel. And I'm just checking it over manually. Uh, my fingers are too chubby <laughs> to copyright the crown there. So I'm just using a little pin vise and rotating it. But uh, manual, manual turnover of the date seems to go okay. So now we're just applying a little bit more 9010, just a very slight amount, cleaning up the excess, and we can put on our day wheel. We'll get this put into place and under a microscope here, just use a small, I use a small little plastic tip thing to pull that jumper back and then seat it between two teeth, just like that. And we'll finish this up by putting in our little clip here, putting this in rounded side down. So it'll make it easy. The next time this watch has to be serviced, you can remove that clip easily. But now we're gonna go ahead and get the dial on. We'll start off by getting the dial spacer on, and that's kind of sits in a channel machined into that main plate. And there's cutouts for all the pushers and uh, the dial feed and the crown and all that. And there goes that dial. And I've had that thing hermetically sealed, like I didn't even breathe on it. Um, I didn't want anything, so that thing's been under lock and key and uh, airtight storage since I removed it. We'll go ahead and uh, time to set the, the hands on this thing. So we're going to rotate this around a little bit. See how my chubby fingers barely get in there, but boom, right there, date flipped over and we can get our hands installed. And as I'm doing this, uh, one more time on this giveaway again, if you'd like to enter to win this watch free of charge again, uh, I will never ask you for payment of any sorts. If anybody does, it is most certainly a scam. But on Sunday, June 7th, I will... Uh, do a screen grab on my computer. We will sort all comments from unique users, excluding myself. So you can comment 10 times, but that'll only count as one entry. And we will use a random comment chooser and pick the winner. And the person picked must be a subscriber in order to be eligible. But if they are, uh, 
All they need to do is email me at the address I'm going to provide on that video. Just send me a screenshot of your computer screen with you logged in and uh, we will make arrangements and I will ship you your watch and that will be on January 7th. So now we uh, we're going to do a reset test here. So we let it run and it's ran for about 20 minutes, 21 minutes and 21 seconds. We'll check the reset and perfect. That is just beautiful. So that thing is going to go undercover and uh, we're going to go ahead and get some casework done on this thing. So as I'm cleaning this case and uh, putting it all back together, um, I again, just like to say thanks to everyone. Uh, I cannot believe we actually hit 5,000 subscribers. I never thought in a million years that would happen. I sure appreciate uh, everything from the folks who commented on the videos, um, folks on uh, patrons of the channel and everyone. I mean, uh, I never knew, you know, you'd always hear that, you know, watch people are great people and kind of every hobby kind of says that, but in my experience, you know, they really are. I mean, it's just full of great people, great back and forth, uh, either from the hobbyist community where if I have a problem and ask a question, I can get help. I try to uh, help answer questions when I can, uh, to just collectors and enthusiasts who come in on the channel, tell me about their watches. I love the back and forth. It's just fantastic. And, um, you know, interestingly enough, uh, two weeks ago, the company I work for my day job, they had their, uh, holiday, uh, party and some there. And, um, a gentleman, one of the executives of the company, he's our CFO. His name is Matt. And, uh, ironically enough, there's three Matt's who are patrons of the channel. Uh, he, you know, he's not one of them, but just another Matt. Um, I only see him just very rarely once or twice a year. Uh, before just a couple of weeks ago, I had last seen him in, uh, uh, had a chance to really talk with him one on one for a while in uh, August. We were on a work trip, and uh, which I was a part of, and he was there. He was wearing a real nice watch, and I had commented, "Hey, I really like your watch." And we talked back and forth. Oh, by the way, uh, that little post on the dial. What I'm going to do here is put the movement, put the case on the movement tip rarely, and use that to index the chapter ring when I install. So that's why I'm doing this right here. But um, we were talking and back and forth about watches and. Uh, um, I had mentioned to him, I said, yeah, well, I have this kind of YouTube channel. I, I like to tinker with watches and I'll upload an occasional video and all that. And oh, cool. You know, it's, uh, very nice and it kind of short, but I mean, I didn't really think much else about it. I ran into him at the holiday party two weeks ago. Hey, Matt, how you doing? Hey, Adam, how you doing? And, um, he said, Hey, I'm really enjoying your channel. I <laughs> got through me for a loop. I didn't realize he was watching. And then uh, later on, his lovely wife came and said, "Hey, you know what? Matt's been watching your videos, and uh, but he he's enjoying them." You know, I was like, I was floored. I was, you know, thank you very much, and it actually meant quite a lot. But uh, I just thought that was great. So, uh, Matt, uh, well, you know definitely who you are if you are watching this. Hello, thank you again for the nice words. Um, hope you enjoy this video. <laughs> so, um, back to this, I'm putting the crystal on, and right there, you can see it like the between the three and the four, right about the three o'clock hour. There is a little piece of tiny little dust or something in there. Um, I do catch that. Obviously I saw that on camera. I actually saw it on the watch later as I was inspecting it before I put it on, but, uh, it came out. I was just, had the dial and movement in there just for alignment purposes, but we got all that put together. And now you can see that index on the backside of that chapter ring. That's where that little, that little nub on the dial is going to sit in that channel. But I got that little piece of dirt removed and made sure it was all clean and pristine inside there. And now this is the, now we're marrying these two for the final time. Oh, that looks so good. I love this watch. I love this watch, by the way. So now we got a, a brand new gasket on our crown. We're going to go ahead and put that in. The gasket's a real, you know, tight seal inside that crown tube, which is great. And I applied a little silicone grease to that and inside the crown tube as well. Perfect. I cleaned up the original pushers um, best I could. There's a kind of tiny little marks on the inside of that were sitting inside the case tubes where dirt had been in for years, but uh, they're not even visible. They're still in great shape. I had to straighten both of them because both, both of them had bins, but now I'm pushing both of those in because the movement ring that we're installing now actually captures those two pushers. So then once the movement rings in, we can release those two. And now we can start putting together the automatic works. And so, yeah, uh, this thing is just, coming together super nice. And by the way, yeah, I was saying, I, I like this watch so much. Actually, what I did was, uh, long after I bought it, cause I've had this watch for about two months, two and a half months and not touched it, knowing that eventually this would be the giveaway. 
but he kept looking at this thing and said, man, I want one of these for myself. So, uh, I've actually sourced another one. It's, um, it's a model 6010, not a 6012. It's one year older than this one. Uh, it's not in as good a shape as this one. Uh, and it does not have the, the rare triple railroad bracelet. doesn't have any bracelet on it. It's going to require significantly more work, but, um, it's a blue on blue, just like this one. And at the end, I'm really hopeful it's going to turn out really well. Um, the loom on that one's much more faded than this one. And like I said, I, I originally thought about maybe reluming because the hands are, you know, the looms a bit faded. I didn't want to reloom the hands and have the hands and the dial really not matching, but then I didn't want to mess with it. There technically is a way to refresh original loom. I don't know how he does it, but you know, we were talking earlier about Spencer Klein, you know, he's the Seiko whisperer. <laughs> um, he's got a way of doing it. Obviously he, uh, he, he, he developed it and he's obviously not giving away his secrets. I don't blame him. Um, but people do send him and he can refresh original loom. I don't know how he does it. It's uh, a chemical concoction he came up with, but uh, it looks beautiful after he does it. I don't know how he does it. Um, this watch actually, I think would be a good candidate for that. If the winner decided that they would like the loom refreshing, that would be who and how I would suggest doing it. And that would keep everything original. Um, but again, I, if I knew his secret, I would have done it, but I don't know how he does it. So, you know, good on him for developing that. So lastly, here we got the automatic works put together. We lubricated the transmission wheel, uh, where the Paul Evers engaged with it and the pivot and I'm applying some lubrication to a couple of the bearings. And now we can install our rotor. Ooh, if I can get it aligned, right? Here we go. Ooh, nice. You'd have think I'd have done that before. <laughs> but we got our rotor in and I'm holding it down with the tool and just tightening that down. And I'm just going to kind of give this a, some rotate it around a few different times. And I'm, I'm checking a, to make sure that it's not touching anything. It's not binding up in either direction. I'm also watching that transmission wheel to make sure it's, it's rotating in the same direction, regardless of which way that I turn the wheel and then just checking the bearing um, and the, the play in the bearing and it's nice and tight. So we've got a brand new gasket for the case back on this and we have applied some silicone grease to it. And on these, you just really want to make sure with these flat gaskets that they're not, that they're flat before you install them. They're not, they're not riding up on one side. But uh, I took that point before I put this on. I went through that thing with Rodico, cleaned up all my excess grease on everything. And we're just putting this case back back on. There we go. And applying some plastic to the case back tool here. Just so we don't put any marks on this thing. Oop, there we go. This is awkward. Maybe I should have edited this part of the video down. It sure is taking a long time. But there we go, torquing that case back down properly. And now this watch is really starting to come together. So it took a bit of work to get that triple railroad bracelet clean. And I removed uh, all the, uh, all the uh, removable links, pulled them down to each individual part, cleaned it all in the ultrasonic a few times. Uh, we're, we're recent. We got the back on the case. I'm, case. I'm reassembling the clasp. You're getting that last pin in. There we go. And now take a look at this watch. I mean, this thing is just stunning. Like I said, that loom is original. Um, Spencer could probably clean that up. I'm not touching it. It's original. Uh, I love it. It looks fantastic. And this watch actually fits me, which is amazing. I never would have thought that. I, I'm in love with this watch, folks. Um, I, mean, uh, I love this watch so much. I can't wait to get my own, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to find a triple railroad bracelet, but yeah, check that out. It actually fits. But again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, January 7th, please keep your eyes out for the giveaway winner announcement. I'm going to keep that video short and sweet like the last one. I won't make you sit through a whole process of a video just to see if you won this watch. But uh, January 7th, I'll announce the winner. Thank you all so much again for getting this channel to 5K subscribers. It, I never would have thought it would happen. It means a lot. If you like the channel, please like and subscribe. And thank you so, so much. We'll see you on the next one. Take care.